welcome everyone to today's CPI talk. Uh, I'd like to introduce Leonard Mashmeyer, who has uh, kindly agreed to provide us this uh, chunk of his time and uh, his expertise in the area. So without any further ado, Leonard, over to you, sir. All right, yeah, let me share my screen and hopefully also my slides. So now you hopefully see them, yeah? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure. My name is Leonard Maschmeyer. I'm a senior researcher at ETH Zurich at the Center for Security Studies. And in the talk today, I'll really give you an overview, trying to, of the research I've been focused on over the last years on subversion and what it teaches us about cyber conflict and how it helps us understand also some current events, especially in Ukraine, which has been a case study. And the starting question and the overall question I'm trying to answer in my research is a really basic one, but also an important one, and one more importantly, possibly, that hasn't really been answered yet by the uh, existing research. It's basically completely contested. And that's the question, how do cyber operations actually matter in world politics? To answer it, I've been developing new theory, but also working on case studies. And then the third leg has been really critically examining the sources of data of our knowledge on cyber conflict. But today I'm going to focus on the first two parts, and in particular, a paper that I published in International Security last year, explaining why the strategic value of cyber operations often falls short of expectations. A starting point, just to you know, have a uh, basis for what I'm talking about, what are cyber operations, actually? And we can use the definition from the US Department of Defense here, and the doctrine that defines them as the employment of cyberspace capabilities where the primary purpose is to achieve objectives in or through cyberspace, which basically means an instrument to project political power. That's, that's the context. And in uh, explaining or maybe predicting how this instrument matters in world politics, most existing work has really focused or, or inferred uh, the strategic value on um, the properties of the technology involved specifically information communications technologies, ICTs, that constitute cyberspace, if you think back of the definition from DOD I just uh, outlined. And it has that existing scholarship has really focused on three main properties of these ICTs. The near instantaneous communication that's possible through them, the global reach, and also a design that has prioritized convenience over security over the years. So because of these characteristics, if you use this technology for cyber operations, the promise is that you have high speed and large scale effects, possibly global ones, and still at the same time, an ease of secrecy and anonymity. There's that famous New Yorker comic that on the internet, no one knows you're a dog, right? That's still to some extent, at least true today. And on top of that, the barriers to entry are presumably very low because in some cases you might just need a laptop to carry out a cyber operation. So with these advantages, the expectation is that this technology enables not only highly effective operations because of the speed, scale, and secrecy, but it also makes it relatively easy and cheap to carry out these kinds of operations. So because of these vast advantages that you supposedly get from the technology, the prediction has been that cyber operations enable a revolution in the nature of conflict, but the disagreement has really been on what type of conflict is involved here. And most of the initial theorizing, that's almost three, uh, sorry, yeah, three decades ago now, has focused or has predicted a revolution in the nature of warfare through really fast, yet massively disruptive or even destructive, and at the same time, very stealthy strategic cyber strikes that are supposedly possible, especially against critical infrastructure, this Time magazine cover from the early 90s visualizes how that uh, idea looked like at the time. It's interesting because it's an Air Force helmet, basically, and that's also where this whole idea of cyberspace is really rooted, and Thomas Ritt has written a great book on that. But this idea has been really influential both on academic scholarship and policymaking. So here's an edited volume from 2009 that really lays out in great detail, this militarized vision of uh, cyber power, national security, and how it fits into military power. That's the idea in the background. And this idea has also persisted over now, as I said, almost three decades. This is a Newsweek cover from the from uh, 2020, actually, uh, 
that brings home this analogy to strategic bombing, right? I mentioned strategic cyber strikes, and the idea is that uh, obviously you can somehow produce something similar to aerial bombing with these cyber strikes, illustrated here with cursors that are falling down. It's important also because this analogy has uh, informed or influenced the adoption of a strategy of cyber deterrence in the US and also by many of its allies in the, this earlier phase of cyber conflict and imagination how it looks like. Fortunately, though, these scenarios of critical infrastructure attacks, they have remained hypothetical. There hasn't been cyber war. And in this, instead, growing research shows that cyber operations are actually relatively ineffective at coercion and also especially the projection of force. So, you know, the analogy to bombing here. Instead, cyber conflict has really been persistently low in intensity below the threshold of uh, armed conflict. And accordingly, reflecting this evidence, expectations have shifted from warfare to conflict short of war, but still expecting a revolution, which is interesting. So current wisdom there expects or suggests that the speed and the scale and the secrecy, so then the same properties that uh, previously were supposed to revolutionize warfare, now enable states to produce outcomes short of war that were not previously possible. And in doing so, opening a new strategic space for competition, for a type of competition that didn't exist before. And furthermore, even if the individual effects of cyber operations are low in intensity, as is becoming clearer and clearer, the cumulative effects, according to this theory, of multiple such operations over time can presumably shift the balance of power especially Richard Harknett and Michael Fisher Keller, Emily Goldman, they make this argument. And they are also the architects, at least play a significant role, have played a significant role in another strategic shift in the US and also now in its allies who are always following in a step from deterrence, as I mentioned, as a strategy to a strategy of persistent engagement, which assumes that the adversaries of the US and the West overall have figured out this advantage of cyber operations and intentionally stay below a certain level of intensity. And then persistently engaging them at this level neutralizes the gains that these adversaries might get and allows you to prevail. Now, this is all plausible without doubt, but like the cyber war theories that preceded it, this whole idea is really mainly based on what's possible in theory with the technology uh, evidence of especially this cumulative impact and shifts in the balance of power remain scarce. We don't really have clear cases. And especially looking at that conflict in Ukraine, I argue it should give us pause because it's been eight years there of conflict short of war involving the frequent use of cyber operations. And still that culminated in a conventional invasion this year, right? So if cyber operations enable these gains short of war, why do we see this outcome after eight years of the use of cyber operations where also there's ample time for cumulative effects? In short, the premise for everything else I'm about to say is this mismatch between expectations concerning the effectiveness and the strategic value of cyber operations in theory and then what we actually observe in practice that's been persistent over the last three decades as well. And my point is that this mismatch actually reflects a lack of theory on the actual mechanisms of cyber power and the operational level of cyber conflict at which these are used. Uh, used. So Stephen Biddle has shown in conventional war the properties of technological capabilities that you know most scholarship in that area also focuses on are far less important predictors of victory in battle than the way force is employed at that operational level. And I argue that the mechanisms of how power is generated at this operational level are just as important in cyber conflict. So it's surprising that there is very little empirical or theoretical work on this level, especially linking these operational mechanisms to strategic value that you get by uh, conducting cyber operations. And to build such a theory, a good starting point, again, is a really basic question, namely, what is a cyber attack? So I said there is this militarized vision of cyber war, right? Cyber conflict, and anal uh, analogous to that, this idea of a cyber weapon that is somehow uh, similar or almost the same as a conventional weapon here, illustrated as a grenade that actors can basically throw at an enemy to cause damage 
But the mechanism of how a cyber attack functions compared to a conventional web is, is very different. And that's why it's useful to really look under, under the hood here, right? So most basic point is generally a cyber attack really refers to an incident that's caused by a cyber operation, which can run weeks, months, or even years before working towards this incident, the effect that it produces. And then the DOD definition I mentioned earlier about producing outcomes, right? That tells us about the purpose of cyber operations, but really little about the mechanisms to achieve that purpose. And it's a mechanism that's unfamiliar to especially traditional security scholars, because what we're really talking about are different varieties of hacking, which in turn refers to the secret exploitation and manipulation of computer systems by uh, exploiting vulnerabilities, flaws in their design to gain unauthorized access to them. And then through creative manipulation, make these systems do things their designers or users neither intended or expected that harm the victim of the operation, obviously to the benefit of the sponsor of an operation. So put it in practical terms, let's say a group of hackers from Russia wanna run a cyber operation or are running a cyber operation against the United States, and they target some specific infrastructure in the Eastern United States. They managed to compromise that infrastructure, manipulate it probably by installing some form of malware and then use this infrastructure to cause some harm to the United States, say by disrupting the operation or creating some collateral damage at um, maybe even physical machinery that's attached to it. The larger question, if you look at this mechanism, is actually what type of power is involved here, right? It's not really about using your own capabilities to generate force as it is in warfare. It's also not about persuasion, bargaining, and threats, the main mechanisms in diplomacy and warfare, use of force and coercion and diplomacy. That are really the two traditional forms of power in international politics. Instead, this is about turning an adversary's own capabilities, the infrastructure in this case here, into instruments of harming that adversary, which clearly doesn't map onto existing forms of power. And as I argued in, an, in another article this year, if we want to look at it from a theoretical lens, it's best understood as a reversal of what's known as structural power in international relations, which is basically the capacity to shape structures of interaction to the benefit of the holder of that power. So in this case, basically building the infrastructure here and then hacking them hacking this infrastructure reverses these benefits into harms. No need to go deeper into this theory, I'm just mentioning it because considering that there isn't really existing theory of power to capture this mechanism, it may seem as novel as the technology that it's, target, uh, that it's targeting, and that's obviously also what uh, prevailing wisdom really starts with as an idea. But if you look back in history a bit, it becomes clear quite, quite quickly that rather than something completely new, this is instead cyber operations are a new way to implement an understudied instrument of power in world politics, and that's subversion, closing the circle here. So consequently, building a theory of subversion really help, provides a foundation for a theory of cyber power and then how it matters in world politics. And that's what I'll do in this uh, second part of, of the talk here. The problem is obviously that subversion is really an under-researched topic, and that means most of the research is narrative and historical, but recently there has been growing attention also more systematic work. Foremost and most useful in the context here is Melissa Lee's work that provides a very simple and also very useful definition of subversion as secret and indirect interference in adversary affairs. If you compare it to warfare, for example, it's always a direct way to interfere. It can be carried out in, in a secret, but there is not really a way to carry out war indirectly, except if you do it through proxy actors, and that always helps you again to maintain some secrecy. But anyway, putting that aside, the central importance of secrecy already suggests that uh, strategically subversion really belongs in the world of covert operations but specifically the non-military covert, uh, uh, the non-military kind compared to covert warfare, as I just mentioned. Now, most of the Cold War literature really defines subversion based on one overarching goal, which is overthrowing a regime, 
And that is one goal that if you look at uh, especially the literature from that period and the cases, a lot of subversive operations and campaigns have pursued, but there are also many other types of goals subversion can uh, fulfill, such as manipulating government policy or public opinion, sabotaging also infrastructure or institutions through uh, agents put in place. So I'm arguing that rather than the goal, it's more useful if you want to think about an instrument of power, especially that the defining characteristic of subversion is the mechanism of action, how it produces these different goals. And that mechanism is exploitation and manipulation. Just the clear parallel here to cyber operations, right? Which means using vulnerabilities in systems and specifically social systems and their constituent parts, so basically the people who are part of these systems, to secretly gain access to them and establish control and manipulate these systems to produce some unaffected, uh, sorry, unexpected effects that harm the victim. So traditionally, subversion has gone after social systems, for example, institutions, organization within a state, but also entire societies and political systems. The vulnerabilities targeted in turn involve both individual pathologies and fallibilities of uh, people, as well as flaws in the security rules and practices of different organizations. So this all sounds quite abstract, of course. Let me give you a practical example again. Take the Soviet KGB dispatching a spy to the United States, infamous for doing so throughout the Cold War, with a false identity. These were known as illegals at the time, with these really carefully constructed cover identities built up over years. So this spy targets an industrial facility, just for sake of the comparison here, that supplies the US government with communication technology and gets employment there by duping a lonely employee, say, to trust them and succeeds because there aren't really sufficient background checks of new employees at that organization. So having established some influence there, that spy then proceeds to secretly manipulate some machinery at that facility in a way that maybe undermines productivity or chance, it changes the design of the equipment itself that introduces flaws that then benefit the Soviet Union. I used an example here involving technology to just make the parallels to cyber operations as clear as possible, but the same mechanism can also be used to manipulate political organizations. And McCarthy was, Senator McCarthy was you know, afraid of this in the United States in the 1950s and started this uh, witch hunt at the time looking for subversives and we see parallels in most other countries as well. So I hope the parallels to cyber operations are already quite clear. Both rely on the exploitation of systems, but the types of systems obviously differ. On the one end, we have social systems, organizations, institutions, groups, and so on. On the other end, with cyber operations, we have socio-technical systems, computer systems that are embedded in modern societies. And with these systems, the vulnerabilities obviously differ as well. Cyber operations can also exploit the social vulnerabilities that traditional subversion goes after, namely pathologies in user behavior, as well as security rules and practices around the use of technology. But they can also target vulnerabilities in the technology itself. Most importantly, these are flaws in the logic of programming code that determine everything that a computer system does. And by exploiting flaws in this logic and creative human manipulating it, making systems do things they're not supposed to. This really is the essence of hacking, at least in the modern sense. So despite all these differences, the mechanism involved exploitation manipulation that really works fundamentally the same way as in traditional subversion. And that's how we get from spies to hackers to pick up the subtitle of the talk. And with this shared mechanism, I argue cyber operations also share the strategic role of traditional subversion as well as its value. This role has been really twofold. Most operations, and this has been the primary purpose of subversion, has been uh, has fulfilled an independent role, basically an alternative to warfare when diplomacy falls short of producing intended outcomes. An example is the infamous CIA uh, operation against former Iranian President Mossadegh, who's pictured here, who fostered a network of undercover agents to erode public support for him that culminated in a, in a coup 
and you know still has repercussions today without that quite likely the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran the, as it exists today would not be there. But subversion can also be used as a complement to the use of force, most importantly warfare. This image here shows undercover agents among Germany's armed forces during World War II who were run by British intelligence and among other things were sabotaging railways to hamper military logistics. So in these different roles, the indirect and secret nature of subversion really endowed with the great strategic promise that comes out throughout the literature of the Cold War as a cheap, easy, and effective instrument of power. Again, clear parallels to expectations around cyber operations. Maybe. And the reasons are the secrecy, uh, providing the advantage here of relatively low risks. If you do it well, the victim and also the world audience, international community does not know does not get wind of actually uh, some operation taking place. In the perfect case, in the less perfect case where cover is still maintained, it's not clear who is behind the operation. So you, you avoid the repercussions. But possibly more importantly, this indirect mechanism of using adversary capabilities, systems that belong to someone else, it really brings down the resource costs. And at the same time, provided you target the right kind of systems, can have a really high impact, as I mentioned in the ideal case, right, overthrowing a regime and in that way, winning without war. So we have clear parallels to current expectations about cyber war or cyber operations, but these characteristics also pose a question, right? Is this a silver bullet if, these, uh, if this promise is true? If there is a way to win without war, why have we seen war throughout the Cold War I mentioned there has been quite a bit of covert warfare, especially proxy wars, would not seem to be necessary if you have this effective instrument, right? And that's also where the gap exists in that literature. And the reason for that, I argue, is that the same characteristics that actually enable this promise, the strategic promise, ironically also preclude its fulfillment in practice in most circumstances, because secrecy and indirect action, they're not given characteristics but they require really significant efforts to attain. And these efforts then constrain effectiveness in three ways. First, they limit the speed because subversive actors have to identify vulnerabilities that depend on these and then develop means to exploit them. This both takes time. The same applies to cyber operations. There is really no way to produce any effects without having a suitable vulnerability in a system capable of producing the effect you want to produce. Second, intensity of the effects is constrained because you depend on systems that belong to others, that means you have to take care not to be discovered. Discovery, on the other hand, or the reason why discovery is a problem is that victims have relatively simple ways to neutralize subversive operations, for example, by arresting a spy, or in the case of cyber operations, deleting a virus or revoking access credentials. And moreover, the more intense the effects you want to produce are, the deeper you really have to gain control of a target network. So if it's a cyber operation, you want to produce some physical effects, right? It's not enough to just get access to some workstation. You actually have to get into industrial control systems. That all raises discovery risks so because you're spreading in, in the system. At each step, there is a chance that the victim gets wind of this, discovers something is there that's not supposed to be. And on top of that, the more capable systems are producing really harmful effects, the better they also tend to be protected. This risk of discovery finally also highlights already the third constraint that we have here, which are the limits of control. On the one hand, control is limited by definition because you depend on systems that don't belong to you, but others, and you depend on the secrecy, so this control is both incomplete and also temporary in most cases. But more fundamentally, because effects depend on making systems do things that their designers, users uh, did not expect them to do, the same applies to you as the actor manipulating these systems who are not fully familiar to you since someone else has usually designed them. That means there is always a risk that these systems behave unexpectedly if you manipulate them, might fail to produce the effect you want or produce some unintended consequences, perhaps some collateral damage. And crucially, these constraints act not only individually, but they interact in a way that poses a trilemma. And I've illustrated that here in this diagram, 
it's a trilemma because at a given level of resource investments, the more you try to improve on one of these variables, the more you tend to lose out on the remaining ones. That's what you see in the diagram here, right? You increase speed, you tend to lose intensity and control. You increase control, you tend to lose intensity and speed. This means that actors face really significant trade-offs where they can maximize at best two of these variables at the cost really of the remaining one. And to illustrate why, just imagine an actor now wanting to proceed very fast with an operation. That means with a subversive operation, there's less time for reconnaissance and development. So accordingly, that actor will know the system targeted less well, will also have less extensive access to it compared to spending more time. So consequently, the intensity of the effects that actor can produce will tend to be lower compared to spending more time, while the risk of something going wrong, failure or just losing control increases. So if you now imagine maximizing both speed and intensity, the risk of control loss increases even further. And vice versa, if you try to do the same with the, in the other uh, permutations that this trilemma uh, produces. And because of these trade-offs, in practice, contrary to the great promise, subversion and cyber operations as an instrument of them are usually too slow or too weak or too volatile to provide strategic value in practice, contrary to what you also read in the media, especially on the fears of cyber war. And importantly, we see these constraints very clearly in the Ukrainian case, not just in the invasion now, where it was quite clear compared to all the cyber war warnings that you got earlier this year, but actually in the eight years that preceded this invasion, where this conflict really has been the paradigmatic case of hybrid war enabled by cyber operations, where the idea has been that in this conflict that's really short of full-scale war in this type of conflict, the use of cyber operations enhances the effectiveness so much that actors like Russia, who have supposedly perfected this kind of warfare, can produce outcomes they could not previously achieve. And obviously, on top of that, Russia presumably is one of the world's foremost cyber powers who has used this conflict, and that's something that's come out of a few analysis as a test lab for its cyber war capabilities. That all means if cyber operations are this newly effective instrument of power, this is where, really where we would most expect to see this effectiveness in action. And conversely, from February this year, with the invasion and the escalation, it has involved the first use of cyber operations in a large scale conventional conflict involving a leading power, where, as I mentioned, you had all these predictions of cyber war of a scope and scale that has not been existent. So uh, that has not uh, existed before. Sorry. So this uh, is where we would expect in both circumstances, both uses of this power, right, as an independent instrument and as a complement to the use of force to see this effectiveness in action. Since I'm looking at strategic goals as the benchmark here, and uh, sorry, as strategic value, it's important to identify obviously the strategic goals that Russia has uh, pursued here. And these go back to the origin of this conflict actually, which started with the decision by Ukraine's parliament in 2013 to start pursuing closer relations to the European Union, which has been a threat perceived as a threat from in the Kremlin of losing Ukraine from its sphere of influence. And accordingly, Russia has really pursued two main goals. On the one hand, and primarily to reverse this pro-Western foreign policy by Ukraine, but also to support that, to neutralize the pro-Western movement, also internal domestic support for this foreign policy in Ukraine. And also an auxiliary goal in general, which you know basically exists in any international competition, is to just weaken Ukraine, weaken the adversary and its capacity to resist Russian uh, projection of power. To achieve these goals, Russia has uh, used a really wide range of instruments, diplomacy, traditional subversion, also covert warfare, but also cyber operations. And I'll focus on three major operations in the phase of between 2013 and 2018 outline how they work, and then discuss the trade-offs of the trilemma within them, and evaluate their strategic value, which in this context means some measurable contribution towards the attainment of these strategic goals, or with the auxiliary one to some uh, determine some measurable contribution to the shift in the material balance of power. The first operation, first cyber operation, attempted to disrupt Ukraine's elections in 2014, 
which were called by the former leaders of the Euromaidan protests that brought down the previous government of Yanukovych and then took over a government. And they called for presidential elections in March 2014 for May 2014. And a few days before these elections, the computer systems of Ukraine's Central Elections Commission's a commission just went down. And it turned out that this was a data wiper that just deleted all data on these systems and effectively disabling them for several hours. So I got conflicting information there from people I interviewed in Ukraine between five and 20 hours overall. But it, what it is clear here is that uh, the victims were able to restore the service before the vote counting started. The reason was that they had systematic backups, which the hackers had apparently missed, which just allowed the victim here to, you know, restore the operation of these systems to their previous state. Consequently, there was no impact on the elections whatsoever. Second operation, um, also attributed to a Russian hacking group, this time Sandworm, one of the most famous or infamous hacking groups, which has been called the most dangerous hacking group in the world by Andy Grimack of uh, Wired Magazine shows a shift in targeting to critical infrastructure sabotage, disrupting the power grid in Kiev and plunging hundreds of thousands of people into darkness just before Christmas 2016. And you know, corresponding to fears that had prevailed for a while, especially in the West, this operation actually built on lessons learned from a similar operation a year earlier, where these hackers had managed to get remote access to some power substations in Western Ukraine and thereby manually entering, basically just taking over control of these workstations, shutting down the power for several hours until the victims could switch over to manual control, which they could luckily do since these are old Soviet designed facilities. In the meantime, though, in the year that had passed, these hackers had developed a much more advanced malware that was in theory capable of physical destruction, overloading circuits by controlling industrial control systems to make them blow up. So this corresponded to the worst fear of strategic cyber strikes received a lot of attention, especially in Western media as you know, the, this one, this headline here raises the alarm for the US power grid. But importantly, this advanced malware failed. The hackers had missed something again here because the industrial control systems that they had targeted with this would reverse IP addresses when you enter commands. So that means the commands that this malware sent out to cause this catastrophic damage went nowhere. In that case, or because of that failure, I would expect the hackers kind of fell back to the same technique they had used in the previous year by manually disrupting the power supply. Yet the victims had learned here that they could switch to manual control and did so much faster within only 75 minutes, the power was back. So with this short outage also, Recall it occurred just before midnight when most people were asleep, most businesses closed, it really had a minimal impact, both economically or psychologically. In this context, important to underline also that power outages have been a relatively common occurrence in Ukraine. It's not that out of the ordinary. That means for most people, this was not such an extraordinary event. And both of these operations were hardly mentioned in Ukrainian media. When I was there in 2018 to interview, conduct field interviews, I met several people who had never heard of these cyber attacks, actually. The third operation I'm looking at here shows another shift in strategy from critical infrastructure sabotage to economic warfare. It involves the same hacking group against Sandworm, which has actually been behind most of the operation against operations against Ukraine. And this operation involved a self-spreading data destroying worm called NotPetya that was hidden in the automated uh, update of a really popular accounting software in Ukraine, which that way spread to most of its private sector and disrupted large parts of its economy as well as some public institutions. And because of this vast scale, it affected around 500,000 systems in Ukraine alone it caused really massive economic damage up to half a percentage point of Ukraine's GDP. And it also disrupted public life. As you see here in, uh, in supermarkets, this is the ransom note displayed on, on screens, the false ransom note, I should say, because it uh, disguised itself as ransomware, but actually there was no way to decrypt data that this worm had encrypted on all of the affected systems, which also included ATMs, 
on top of that, uh, sorry, the ticketing system in Ukraine's subway in, in Kiev, and also a bunch of Western firms, which leads to the third point here, the international spread of this uh, virus, because it didn't only affect Ukraine, but spread to overall 65 countries, even to Russia, where it disrupted, among other targets, Rosneft, that giant state-owned oil company there. And forensic analysis by some cybersecurity firms later showed this spread actually was clearly unintended. It was a loss of control by the hackers over this malware, which then produced this collateral damage and ultimately triggered sanctions by the West that imposed further cost on, uh, on Russia. And in line with this conclusion that this was a loss of control, it's worth noting that the successor to NotPetya called Bad Rabbit really worked mostly the same way, except one, in, or except to one difference, clear efforts to control its spread. Rather than automate it, it was a manual mechanism to spread it. It affected much less systems, but as a consequence of that, uh, of that it was also strategically irrelevant. So bringing this all back to the constraints I started at the beginning, I just want to give a short overview of this here, obviously. On the first operation, we see maximization of speed. This proceeded really quickly, only three months of total development time. If you compare that to an operation like Stuxnet, the US-Israeli operation that damaged uh, nuclear enrichment centrifuges in Iran in 2010, that took five years of preparations. Here we only have three months, so significantly faster. It pursued medium intensity of effects. I'm using a scale here derived from work on covert operations. I explained a lot of detail in the paper. I don't have the time to do it here. Just trust me, this is a, a, a scale funded and uh, founded in previous or founded on previous research. But the hackers really had insufficient control here to produce an impact on those elections because they missed the existence of backups that allowed restoration of service. As a consequence, there is really no measurable strategic value here whatsoever. Similar situation concerning the strategic value with this power grid sabotage, even though it's quite a different combination of um, priorities here because we see a maximization of intensity. As I mentioned, the attempt was at least to produce physical damage. Accordingly, as one would expect, with this high intensity, it required a lot of preparation, 31 months of development overall for that power grid sabotage operation. And still, they did not have enough control over those systems to produce that intended effect. And instead, they are neutralized, the hacker's control is neutralized by victims who just lock them out within 75 minutes. But Petya finally maximized really both speed and intensity. It was relatively fast, six months of preparation, and also high intensity of effects pursued just to the vast scale of systems targeted, even though individually it was just about data destruction. However, this came, and that's in line with what you expect based on the theory here, this came at a total loss of control, right? You maximize two variables, you basically lose out on the remaining one, which was control over the spread of the malware, producing collateral damage, costs for Russia through disruption there, and unintended consequences too, especially the disruption of Russia's industry, as well as the sanctions imposed, which again, if you consider these costs here, thinking about strategic value, it's uncertain whether this was actually a net gain for Russia. So to sum up, these operations so far have really provided minimal strategic value for Russia throughout uh, this phase of the conflict, as I mentioned, there are several others. I'm just finishing the book manuscript on this, so there are seven operations overall, but that largely holds true throughout them. Same for cumulative effects. Ukraine has not changed its pro-Western foreign policy throughout this time, and is also unexpectedly effective resistance against Russia's invasion this year also challenges assumptions that these uh, subversive operations, these cyber operations, somehow eroded its capacity to resist. And overall, something I want to underline here is that this entire hybrid war strategy of aggression short of full-scale war that cyber operations were really an integral part of failed, right? Russia did not achieve any of its key goals. And that is also why Russia invaded, if you think about it. The alternative to war failed. So we see the fallback to war as the classic instrument of projecting power. And with that fallback, the panic of cyber war kind of boiled up again earlier this year. I've selected a few headlines here. 
warning of a massive cyber war, a global cyber war, and even a threat to the global system. The idea was that really Russia had held back its most powerful capabilities so far. And we would only see them in action now that the conflict escalates to this level. This was actually also a critique leveled at the article I published on this last year, showing these limitations. But that's not what happened in practice. So there was a lot of activity, and I'll I'd outline it uh, shortly here. The first one, or the first wave, basically was a set of data wipers called Whispergate, Hermetic Wiper, Caddy Wiper, Isaac Wiper. I think there have been a few more. I haven't uh, traced all their names, but what they share is we know that they affected some systems in Ukraine, possibly some government systems, but there is no data on a scale or impact. So Microsoft has put out this really uh, sensationalist reports, but if you read the small print, it says they have no data on impact of any of these operations. And more importantly, there is no evidence indicating any significant impact on Ukraine's government's ability to respond to the invasion or also just public life in general. The same applies to a set of website defacements also early this year, January and February, that basically posted threatening messages on government websites, really remain inconsequential. Also, same is true for several waves of DDoS attacks that overload servers with requests, a bit like overstuffing a mailbox with letters so no one can use it. The worst effect seems to have been the worst measurable one, at least, some temporary disruption of some bank services in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine's. So the data here is obviously still insufficient, but the theory provides a simple explanation why these cyber operations were even less intense and impactful, basically causing individual inconvenience rather than anything that raises to the level of strategic significance in Ukraine, and that's time pressure. All of these were put together within several weeks, maximum a few months for some of these data wipers, much less time spent than the previous operations. And apart from this low-level activity I have just discussed, Russian hacking groups also attempted two higher-profile cyber attacks, but both failed to produce strategic value for similar reasons, as I'll explain in a bit. So the first one was a really audacious attempt to disrupt military communication. Precisely at the time Russia's invasion started at 6 a.m. on February 24, or I think it actually might be February 23, I might have mixed up the numbers here, apologies for this, uh, the Viasat satellite communication service via KSAT went offline, and it later analysis showed malware had actually corrupted firmware of satellite modems, irreparably so. How does this link to the conflict? Because Ukraine's military actually relied on this satellite communication service. And initial reporting now suggested that this disruption also disrupted Ukraine's military communications. Elena Kashima reported in the Washington Post, and then one Ukrainian government official stating there was really a huge loss of communications. But that same official, Viktor Joa, has since come on the record in The Economist last week, underlining there was no tactical impact on Ukrainian military operations. Of course, we have to take it with a grain of salt since here it's in the interest of Ukraine's government to state this, but it's important to note it is in line with, with, with the evidence of what we actually saw on the battlefield, right? Ukraine's military being far more effective against the materially far superior Russian army than expected. And in the context of strategic value, this operation failed to produce any effect on its target, but on the other hand, it did produce collateral damage, again, underlying that risk, because it's not only Ukraine's military who was using the service, but a range of customers across Europe, all of whom were affected by this outage. And among them were wind turbine operators in uh, Western Europe. And initial reporting suggested, and I've selected one here, that thousands of these wind turbines went offline. But journalist Kim Zetter later clarified that it was actually just the monitoring software that went offline near the turbines itself kept turning. Still, this collateral damage again illustrates the risk of control loss, especially as actors pursue more intense effects, such as this lasting disruption here, especially under time pressure, which seems to have been the case in this context overall. The second operation and final one by a Russian actors so far involved the reappearance of that old uh, adversary sandworm that's been behind most of the previous cyber attacks too, 
And here they attempt to repeat this feat of causing a blackout through a cyber operation in April 2022. And they actually didn't only try to pr produce the same effect, they actually used the very same malware as in 2016, and they combined it also with the wiper they had just used the previous month, Caddy Wiper, one of that wave of wipers I just talked about. So since this was known malware, known code though, where you know antivirus programs would just pick up the signature in an ideal case, the victims were able to discover this intrusion and neutralized it, deleted this malware before the hackers pr could produce any effect. So this operation actually constitutes the clearest failure of all. It just did not do anything. And at, at the same time, it really illustrates two challenges you face with these kinds of operations. The first one is the need to stay secret, the need to stay hidden until you produce an effect. So there is some talk of loud cyber operations that you know somehow announce themselves, but that's not really how it works because victims can just neutralize most intrusions. You need to stay hidden at least until you produce your effect on that system. It also shows the limits of what even advanced hacking groups. I mentioned, right, this is supposedly the world's most dangerous hacking group according to, to at least one journalist what they can achieve under time pressure. The evidence available suggests that they had at least uh, at most a few weeks to prepare this operation in contrast to the two and a half years for the preceding one in 2016. So what are the implications? What's the conclusion from, from all this? First one is obvious from everything I, I said on the theory, right? Rather than something novel, revolutionary, some new instrument of power, cyber operations were really new means of subversion that share both the, the promise, but also the pitfalls of this instrument, where in theory, they're really fast, impactful, also stealthy, but in practice, because of this, these constraints posed by the trilemma, they're too slow usually, or too weak or too volatile to produce strategic value, which consequently is limited in most circumstances. And furthermore, contrary to the expectedly cheap, easy, and effective nature of these operations, they do involve significant challenges. And overcoming these challenges, illustrated by the or that result in the trilemma, requires further resource investments typically. And that increasingly forfeits the cost advantage, right? So it means they're difficult and possibly expensive, especially if compared to alternatives. So We've seen over the last weeks and months now that Russia keeps bombarding critical infrastructure in Ukraine with just missiles. And that just shows clearly if you want to produce this kind of effect, destroy critical infrastructure, disrupt the power supply, using conventional military forces, obviously more effective, likely also more efficient actually than cyber operations because it just takes a long time to produce this effect, which then might just be temporary after all. Strategically, the main implication is that this is really an attractive option for leaders, but it is also in most cases ineffective. Still throughout the Cold War, the literature shows that policymakers have really tended to overestimate the strategic value of subversion. And we see the same now, I would argue for cyber operations, especially underlying this US strategy of persistent engagement, right? The fear that other states can somehow shift the balance of power without going to war. So accordingly, I would expect leaders to use these operations regularly, even as the limitations become more apparent, because it does remain a low cost and yet potentially high reward option, which is worth trying in most situations, especially if the alternative is going to war. But because of their limitations, the impact of the availability of this new tool on international security conflict overall, I would expect is limited highly impactful operations that significantly contribute to strategic goals are not impossible, but really remain improbable in most circumstances. And ironically, it's uh, the problem is that the very constraints that limit the effectiveness against intended targets raise the risk of collateral damage against unintended targets, because the harder actors really try to produce some strategically relevant effects against specific targets, the likelier they are to cause collateral damage against some unintended targets because they lose control. So that means while the impact on international politics, international security likely remains limited, cyber operations can still have significant impact on individual organizations affected, especially vulnerable groups like civil society. So Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto has 
really research documented in detail how this easiness of adapting tools that are meant for international espionage and interference to surveillance and subversion of dissident groups. And that really raises the exposure of such groups to these kinds of threats. And at the same time, these groups usually lack the resources and the information to fend off these threats. That's something I've also been engaged in trying to improve with, with the Threat Intel Coalition initiative to give civil society better access to Threat Intel. On the policy side, I've talked about persistent engagement as a strategy, right, which has already been implemented in the US and it's being picked up increasingly by its NATO allies, but rests on really speculative assumptions that are not only unproven, but they also put it at risk of being both ineffective and possibly destabilizing because persistence is not only, or sorry, is only one ingredient of a success or a successful operation. Creativity and manipulation and maintaining stealth matter just as much. And that means privileging persistence here as the one key to success, risk losing track of these other uh, characteristics. At the same time, it presumes that cyber operations can be more impactful in, as you know, in theory, they presumably are, but actors have in practice tacitly agreed to stay below this threshold of war. If I am right, on the other hand, operational constraints, uh, constraints that trilemma more likely explains the limited intensity of cyber conflict. There's no evidence on, you know, on the other hand of this tacitly agreed upon low intensity of conflict. So if that's the case, and then the US, its allies, they push forward with more disruptive operations that really risks affecting the cost benefit calculations of its adversaries towards pursuing more intense effects. And then that brings greater risks of collateral damage and control loss. Second implication is for cyber norms initiatives. So if, if it's true that cyber operations offer a less violent alternative to war, right? The question becomes whether it's desirable to regulate and restrict their use through cyber norms, as several such initiatives have attempted, especially if it's about a general ban. So much on the theory, what it can explain, but I should uh, highlight what the limits are before I close. And there is one key limit, which is that I have focused on one actor and one case. So while both the actor and the case remain at the forefront of cyber conflict for the reasons I've mentioned. And even though this case you know, has a lot of internal variations, there is no other case that has comes even close in the number of cyber operations used there. Still, this is clearly a limitation for generalizability. So the question that remains is whether the trilemma as a constraining factor really applies across operations by different actors and in different contexts. So I'm planning to do more case studies here and also ideally run a simulation coming as close as possible to real conditions to test whether these uh, constraints do play out in practice the way I would expect them to do. Second one is though, what are conditions for success and failure? The theory tells us a lot about uh, operational mechanisms and constraints, but it doesn't tell us under what conditions really an operation might succeed or fail. The, Third question, or the, the third limitation that leads to the third question is a bigger one, and that's under what conditions do the conclusions I've just laid out to you change? And that finally brings you to the bigger question that's been in the background of uh, this project and the paper I just presented or where most of this, con uh, this talk came from. And that's how does technological change alter the quality of subversion as an instrument of power? So I've shown that cyber operations are subject to the same types of constraints and the trilemma as traditional subversion. But there are also clear differences in the targets, in the means of exploitations, and the types of effects these operations can produce. So obviously, it's possible that these differences might alter the strategic role and value of subversion in some more subtle ways than you know, the revolution that has been predicted to us. And that's what I'm doing in my upcoming book that hopefully comes out this year, right now, the working title is Subversion that compares the Soviet campaign to crush the Prague Spring in the 60s and then has the full analysis of Russia's cyber campaign against Ukraine, both before and now during the invasion. Finally, one thing we could uh, speculate now going into the realm of speculation here could change the uh, conclusions here is another technological revolution, and that's the rise of artificial intelligence which could really alleviate some of these constraints through automation, 
but could also facilitate detection and mitigation of intrusions. So it's not clear whether it benefits the intruders or the defenders. Especially then thinking about autonomous weapons, this is really where the, the major conclusion about the limited impact on international security, where that might uh, tumble, because the basic point is that today, at least most computer systems are not designed to kill or destroy. What changes if they are though, right? That's what I've started looking into more recently, and I just have a paper under review on that. But I want to stop here, and I hope this has been interesting, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Uh, Good hi, afternoon. Emily. So thank you to, uh, to Lennart for that incredibly informative chat. Uh, Adam Molnar, our CPI member and uh, the, the person who's been kind enough to uh, to chair this discussion uh, was a little delayed today. We've all been there, so I will hand it over to Adam. Hey, hello, everybody, and hi, Leonard. Thanks so much for that talk. Um, so I think your talk, Leonard, really sort of lays bare the the contribution that systematic inquiry can make to so many assumptions that are made about uh you know the veracity and and efficacy of of cyber operations today so for me in particular uh yeah i'm always very um inspired by the way that that this type of research can can bring to bear uh, on a lot of uh status quo assumptions particularly those that are made in the media um, and especially through a historical lens, the way you do. So, um, so uh, I think you're doing excellent work, and and we're really uh, happy that you've shared it with us today. Um, so, with that, I have some some questions in mind, but I also wanted to turn to our attendees. Um, we have some folks here. You could either uh, send through your questions in the chat, or please feel free to just jump in, turn on your mic, put up your hand whatever you prefer, if there's any in there in the audience. Looks like I answered all questions, huh? Yeah, OK, well, then with that, I'll kick off. Um, I think there's a couple things. One is, uh, to me, it, it's, you know, as, as you sort of you know, you went through great pains to, to know, you know, the way that like, how do we actually calculate strategic success and that this is, this is very difficult, uh, given the contingencies at play and, you know, um, there's layers of, of consider of, of assessing impacts and outcomes, right? Psychological being one of them as, as much. Kind of curious how, you know, how you, with that also comes the question of of failure. And one of the things that I've actually, you know, I've looked at in, in a different sort of venue is, is the notion of uh, failure inspired learning, right? How it's actually not success that drives reinvention, but it's actually the policy learning actually happens through through failure, and that this is a sort of uh, this is a sort of trajectory, um, and so I'm curious whether you know what you're finding with your historical analysis for your upcoming book, as well as how it ties to the present. Is there an extent to which failure inspired learning is is a part of a part of this process where you see the the iterations of of new new strategies at work? Or is it the case that you know there's just not enough uh, data out there at the moment to be able to to do that kind of process tracing work? Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because actually success and I mentioned at the end too, right? It's been something on my yeah. mind, so I'm just working with Miriam Duncavity on a paper right now on why aren't there any failed cyber operations if you look at the media reporting. So right. that's more on the side of. You know, why is there this mismatch persistent between expectations and the evidence? And we're really looking into how narratives are constructed, looking at different operations where there's quite clearly a failure. If you at least at base level, there's just no impact. But then people can just, and mostly being journalists or threat researchers, can up with all kinds of interpretations of 
maybe this was a 3D chess game that we just don't fully understand, you know, mm. and then you can imagine whatever. But on the question of learning, I mean, that's specifically also the way I set up. I mean, that's why I think Ukraine is useful because we do see these multiple iterations. There is no other case that has mm -hmm. that. So considering that they really had eight years and they've tried out, you know, a, a wide range of effects and there is some learning and you see really mm -hmm. for me it's interesting because i see attempts to escape these constraints but no escape from the interplay of these constraints overall so it seems to and yeah that's one potential criticism right that learning might just do away with all of this but that's not what you see from the evidence on the contrary you see despite mm -hmm. learning these constraints persist so mm -hmm. it seems to be more I mean, learning allows you to do something in individual uh, operations. But I think, I mean, my suspicion is that the skills are not that transferable because each system, and you know, we see that, right? They miss something, they miss backups there, then they miss these reversed IP addresses. Mm -hmm. These systems are very complex and they're also very different, especially when it gets into physical effects. So I think there's just enough of new things that you need to learn again for each operation is always creativity too that it's not in a way that you have a, a, at least not a linear curve where you know you reach a certain threshold and then suddenly you, you're much faster yeah and now some threatened people for example they keep throwing around all this terminology about the war now that we have faster breakout times and i don't know what did the delta is daring you know it's a whole lingo attached to it but still, the basic point is that we see most of this was done under time pressure, and they had it's the same group involved as well that has eight years has had eight years to prepare. So the only side where we see a really impact of learning, I would say, potentially, is the Ukrainian side, because they've had also eight right. years to learn from all these attacks, and they've become quite effective and also quite simple ways to mitigate them, the most basic one being backups. Uh, that's something that doesn't always come out of at least the early reporting, right? It was more about, oh, maybe Russia is that bad, but maybe it's also that the Ukrainians are that good at defending their networks, keeping them mm -hmm. clean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, okay, thanks for that response. Uh, folks in the audience, are there any other questions? I have another one. But uh, it'd be great to hear from some folks in attendance. Okay, so then I have, uh, I guess I have two questions and maybe you can choose which one. Because you, you know, you mentioned that uh, you're looking for other case studies. Um, so one question I'd have is, is uh, when you've been sort of sniffing around, I'm curious to hear where you've actually sort of what what you're lingering on in terms of possible um, areas of inquiry, um, and how that might change, um, you know, some of the assumptions that you've made in this particular study as well. Just specifically, um, and then the second is is one that how we sort of define the, the boundary of what, what is sort of um, conflict versus sort of sort of persistent um, cyber operations that happen both outside of, of, of the boundaries of what is assumed to be military conflict or live conflict or a hot war or, and how do we, you know, so then when we think about strategies and, and success is, is there you know, are there fewer concerns that things might go uh, sideways during a you know de de you know deploying deployment of an operation or malware in a live conflict? Um, you know, well, if look, if there's a little bit of of spillover into Europe, you know that may be that may be an issue. In some instances, it may may be less in others. Uh, so I'm I'm kind of curious how the definition of like, of uh, you know the boundaries of what we even term sort of live conflict maybe matters for, for you know thinking about what strategies of success exist or uh, if if that makes sense. Anyways, it's because 
I mean, this is sort of a, there's a chronic background noise of, of cyber operations just consistently, right? Um, and, um, you know, I, I definitely take your point that, you know, a, a cruise missile hitting a, uh, a substation directly um, makes things go boom in a completely different way than, than you know, uh, you know, a physical outcome through through um, a CNO or something. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, how, I'm curious how you, whether you've thought about like, you know, cyber operations just being mere politics. It was Klausowitz that said, you know, like war is, you know, politics by uh, other means. Uh, or I suppose Foucault inverted that. And so I'm thinking that like, to what extent is, is this tied into war and physical, military conflict or what extent is this just sort of like um a, a chronic condition now of of geopolitics and and how that might impact your own analysis mm. yeah i mean that's a good question it also that reflects what i was saying historically it's mainly been an independent instrument right so from that standpoint you wouldn't really expect that cyber operations are playing such a huge role in armed conflict because Generally, and that's also, I didn't say too much about that in detail, that's also actually how Russia has used them against Ukraine before the outbreak of the war. So, I mean, yes, there has been actual covert, semi-covert warfare in eastern Ukraine, but cyber operations remained irrelevant to all that, also to the takeover of Crimea, mm -hmm. the attempt to take over the Donbass. Rather, we see very clearly that and it's striking because it's on the very day after the final referendum in Donbass is concluded that they start sending out the phishing emails for this power grid disruption in 2015. And so it's not only that timing, but overall, it's quite clear that from the Russian perspective, and of course, we don't see the decision making, but the way they used it, this is an alternative to force. So they went as far as they wanted or could, but wanted, as we see now, with force in eastern Ukraine. And then as that conflict reached a stalemate in 2014 uh, May, obviously, yeah, there have been casualties since then, but the front lines haven't really moved decisively. No side has, you know, won, basically. So then they started opting for cyber operations for the rest of Ukraine's territory that they couldn't reach with military force to try to still produce some outcome. And that's also how it fits into international politics, this instrument to me in general, because I mean, that's how subversion has been used too. And maybe one thing, if we think about the context, because you might think that this is really a tool for the weak, because it's about, as I said, like using someone's strength against them, right? But fortunately for the weaker actors, it seems to be more the case that you need to have really a certain base level of knowledge, you basically need to already have the same structures in place in order to be able to subvert them for others, because otherwise it's just very hard to get enough knowledge of it. So we see some actors like North Korea and Iran that are quite adept at cyber operations, but not on the same level as uh, Russians, or I mean, also we only have one example from the US and, the, and Israel, but which remains the most advanced cyber operation to date. So all that Leads to, I mean, the short point is, I think it is really, it fits into the background. Subversion remains in the background of diplomacy and warfare, but it can sometimes produce quite significant outcomes like that one in Iran. The question is more than to what extent can cyber operations really reproduce this range of effects, right? So it's about overthrowing regimes, I said, manipulating government policy or eroding infrastructure, eroding trust in societies. And if you think about it, it seems to be that cyber operations are only really good at producing, reproducing one of these kinds of effects, and that's really this long-term erosion. But even there, it's uncertain. So, I mean, I think that's what persistent engagement as a strategy gets right. But where it's wrong is that we don't really have evidence of this impact, as I mentioned. And I, that brings me to the first question you had. I also, I don't see any good case studies. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. So you could argue that Russia had, and, and some of the persistent engagement people do so, that Russia has been engaged in a long-term erosion strategy against the US, but there are actually quite few operations that we know of uh, in case there are more. 
And there isn't really any clear impact, even for the 2016 election interference that supposedly has been part of it. The impact itself remains hotly contested, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that really shows the problem if it is about these cumulative effects. And that is how do you isolate them if it's above uh, over such long periods of time? So in Ukraine, mm -hmm. it's eight years. A lot changed in the time. Several governments, you know, some economic changes. How do you isolate the the influence of cyber operations in that. And if you read the mm -hmm. book on persistent engagement that's come out from Harknet, Goldman, and Fisher Keller, they have some case kind of vignettes, but and all these cases show plausible ways how cyber operations could have made some difference. But importantly, they don't really prove any causal connection. Mm -hmm. And probably I uh, would argue because it is very, very hard to do so, especially mm -hmm. for the cumulative effects. So that's mm -hmm. Yeah, that remains a challenge. I And that's why I mentioned, right, I th I'm planning to really try to do that through simulation because mm -hmm. there is just not enough empirical evidence out yeah. there, right? It's interesting to think about whether there's any, in that instance, but, you know, whether there's any confounding variables that end up being consistent and that that is maybe sort of a finding in itself, right? That, that this is very difficult to study, mm -hmm. um, but there might be some patterns in terms of what, uh you know you know confounds the you know it as a researchable problem as well right so that that's maybe the next step uh you know what the contribution can be um yeah this is this is a great conversation uh, i see eric george has just popped up in in video here do you are there any other questions from the audience or eric george if you have one i do have one uh great chat so far leonard and uh thank you adam for uh for making it in and 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 asking such poignant questions i was curious so we we if we if we sort of look at this through a public perception lens so there are certainly plenty of uh mainstream media references to uh you know foreign interference in elections and you know it it does seem to crop up in in mainstream media reasonably often that such and such a country has been accused of you know cyber interference etc cetera, etc cetera. you know your usual suspects being obviously the russians uh chinese uh iran uh north korea now my, my question is because we don't have the same you know line in the sand response to uh, cyber attacks that we would to a military attack. So someone fires one bullet from North Korea to South Korea and we have an international incident, uh, you know, but arguably the damage that could potentially be done through a concerted cyber attack is, is obviously substantial. Do you feel like there's a, a need for a more uh, you know, legal and uh, measured response when foreign actors have been shown to do something of a nefarious nature? Or do we fear that perhaps the media constantly mentioning that, you know, such and such country has done X, but there doesn't appear to be any specific consequences? Do you feel that overall there may be sort of a chilling effect on the seriousness of uh, foreign actors because it isn't such a cut and dried, we're going to war type of response? Yeah, I mean, this is obviously a very tricky problem. If you think about responses, I think legal responses are really useful, I mean, if at all useful for a cyber crime, right? If you can find the people behind it. Right. Possibly, I mean, the US is sending signals with these indictments it's put out of Russian hackers. But that also then plays into the world of international politics because basically what these indictments do is that they show, hey, we see you, right? We know when you log into your computer. And there might be, there will be personal consequences for you and your family if you engage in this. But on the really, if you think about international responses, some retaliation with sanctions, that, that's the main tool that comes into mind that has been used. And that remains also the main tool used by the Western Alliance short of war. But we also know it has limited effects. And I mentioned cyber norms. I think this is really pretty much futile as a way to curb this activity because it's also in the interest of Western powers to keep using this capability. And that's where the linkage, to me at least, is useful to intelligence contests, intelligence activity. Mm 
because there it's not that much about offense and defense and the idea that and you know the comment the question you ask kind of reflects that too that if someone gets through your defenses it's a win for the other side but if you look at it from that intelligence perspective it might also give you great visibility in the uh, adversary agency involved there or the institution because the problem is really uncertainty in all this contest it's about unexpected effects you know secrecy you don't really know who's going after you doing what but if you catch some actor in your systems and you're able to have surveillance over them monitor their activity you reduce your own uncertainty and you if you do it well I mean that's what persistent engagement is, is supposed to do but we haven't seen much evidence of it it also disrupts or causes some friction at the source of that activity but that also becomes questionable in the context of you know historical intelligence contests because it was a taboo at that time to go after operational centers so they would go after each other's agents in the field but usually not going after the handlers of those agents or you know who would be based in embassies or you know the kgb headquarters for example in uh in Russia, of course, for espionage, if you get a double agent, great. But for some disruptive effect like sabotaging it, you know, if you want to blow up the gas there, the gas was a gas leak, something like that. That's really been a taboo. So that's where persistent engagement, if it does that, and that's an uncertain thing, might already be an extremely robust response to activity that's traditionally been accepted among uh, especially great powers. So if if we say it is accepted, we're back at the starting point that you raised, right? It might be quite damaging. And that remains an open question. I'm more optimistic than I was a few years ago because I went into this project assuming that this is a revolution. It's a huge threat, especially for democracies. But fortunately, the evidence doesn't really, all the available evidence doesn't really support that fear. There is much more evidence of the limitations of these operations. Also, disinformation, that's another uh, branch of the research I've been pursuing here. I just have a paper now and a review looking into disinformation in Ukraine, which again is a basically ideal conditions for these kinds of operations. It's close to Russia culturally, linguistically, historically. Ukrainian society is really pervaded by Russian agents, including its media landscape. They have these oligarchs who own TV stations there. So really fantastic reach for Russia. And then you also have more and more people using social media. And we looked into the use of social media compared to traditional media to spread disinformation. So narratives that we know Russia has been spreading. And it turns out that traditional television is actually, or traditional media television that we focused on is a way more powerful, effective means of reaching people and also making them believe just through repetition in these stories compared to social media, where we didn't see any systematic effect of being exposed and then believing into these narratives, which greatly surprised me. I did not expect that at all, especially since we focused on a set of anonymous telegram channels, which are presumably the the main outlet for Russian disinformation in Ukraine have been over the last years so all of that suggests that you know the new technology doesn't make this instrument more effective and throughout history there has been a lot of fear of it but also there are very few examples of subversion really making a difference and yeah I've talked for a while now but I actually realized there's one last thing that's maybe worth closing with because in 1986, there was a report from a congressional committee on active measures in the US, which wrote this long expose about Russian active measures, including disinformation, subversion, basically, and the grave threat it poses to the Western alliance, because they're just far more advanced, new technology makes it far more powerful. And basically, the West has nothing against this, they're going to win. And we know three years later, <laughs> did not really work out that way, right? So there's some reason to be optimistic, not to say that we should dismiss the threat, but uh, I think it's more important to be balanced. And especially if we see this role of television, polarized media landscapes, television stations like Fox News, right? They can cause much more damage compared to some foreign interference through social media, which might be picked up by these media stations. But still, if we think about threats, I would really focus more on that. <laughs>
Thank you for that uh, very replete response, Leonard. That uh, answers more than one question. So thank you very much. Adam? Yeah, I think that's a great point to end off on is, is uh, you know, the, the definition, construction and, and elevation of certain threats uh, beyond others. And, and um, so I think Leonard, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, a fabulous talk. Um, I think one that, that we'll probably continue to think about when we um, engage uh, the media uh, in coming weeks and months. Look forward to your book. Look forward to the papers that you, you say uh, are under review now. And, um, and I would just say, um, you know, for any folks that want to reach out to Leonard, um, I'm not sure that your email was on the, um, was on the talk uh, um, call. But uh, for any folks that, that want to reach Leonard, you could you can find him online, of course, or uh, or you can reach out to us, and we'd be happy to put you in, in touch. So, once again, thanks so much, Leonard. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your evening. And um, unless there's anything from the audience, I don't think there is. But um, <laughs> yeah, no. So I hope you have a good the rest of your evening, and uh, we'll be in touch again soon, hopefully. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your day, folks. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.